yesterday I had the most wonderful time. We were, um, I, along with Ralph and Bev Milton and around a hundred other people participated in Story Fest at Canloops United Church. And so I need to put in a little plug here. We're going to be doing um, parts two and three of Story Fest at the end of the next couple of months, October 28th in Summerland, November 25th right here. Uh, different stories each time, and it was amazing. None of us knew quite what to expect because Ralph, if you know Ralph at all, Ralph gets great ideas in his mind. And sometimes, like me, there's a struggle to get the idea from here out. And so we weren't sure exactly how it was going to work, but it was really incredible. In the course of the day, we shared three Bible stories, <clears throat> and we shared them in different interpretations and from different angles and with different emphases, and then invited people to divide into small groups and talk about them, and some of those people then shared that with the wider group. And it was amazing. Different understandings and different emphases of these Bible stories that different folks had. It reminded me of one of the things that I value so much in our tradition is that we're not afraid of Scripture and we're not afraid to approach it from different angles and we're not afraid to let someone else get something different out of it than we get. I remembered a conversation I had many years ago with someone who was part of one of my churches in Vermont. And he was a good friend both before and after this conversation, but the conversation got a little heated. And he wanted to know what a certain Bible passage meant. And I said, well, it could mean a variety of things. And I'm giving one of those, you know, nice, good, united church style answers. Where, well, it could mean this, but it might also mean that. And yet this too. And what do you think? And maybe that. Well, poor Ed was not going to have any of that. <clears throat> and he said, you're the minister. You ought to know what it really means. And so I thought, okay, I need to give him an answer. So I thought of what, you know, kind of my preferred understanding of the text, and I dutifully explained it as best I could, to which he said, well, I don't get that out of that story at all. <laughs> I love those moments when someone else proves you right, you know. Different passages mean different things. Sometimes because we just don't know what the writer was saying. Sometimes because different context gives them a whole different, well, meaning. And sometimes we need to hear different things at different times. So all of that is a setup to tell you that I want to give two different ways that this parable that John read this morning, has been interpreted over the years a couple of different ways, and these are not the definitive ones. It doesn't mean that there aren't other options either. But I want to share these two and just leave them with you, not to pronounce a ruling and say, this is what it really means, and you'd better believe this. <clears throat> so a couple of ways that this has been interpreted, interpreted over the centuries in a variety of traditions, one of them kind of takes its beginning point from the fact that this story is unique to Matthew's gospel. Only Matthew tells us this parable. Whether the others knew it and thought, nah, that's not important, or whether Matthew simply thought it was, we don't know. But it fits well with Matthew's gospel. Matthew's gospel was written for a specific church at a specific time with a specific problem. Now, I know it's hard to believe that a church would have a problem, but work with me here, okay? Especially the problem that Matthew's church had, it was that people did not always get along with each other. I know that one's hard to believe too, or not. Basically, what was going on in Matthew's church is there were kind of two congregations, and it was not a huge number of people. Okay, we hear church and we think, a nice big crowd like us, but this was a, a small group, maybe, we're guessing, pure guesswork, maybe 20 or 30 people. They saw themselves, though most of them were Jewish, and they saw themselves as being another synagogue. They didn't see themselves as being something completely different. 
They didn't see Jesus as being the founder of anything new. They saw Jesus for who he saw himself as, as a great rabbi. And so they thought, okay, we're not just another Jewish synagogue. It's just, we're really kind of focused on the teachings of Rabbi Jesus because he was right on. But we're still Jews. That's part of our heritage. That's who we are. There were some other folks in that church who were Gentiles who had joined this group because they'd heard the teachings of Jesus and realized that they applied to them in their lives. And they wanted to be a part of it. So in they come to this church, plunk themselves right down in a pew. Well, they didn't have pews, but whatever. And said, yeah, we're a part of this too because Jesus said we could be. Right? Jesus talked about how everyone is welcome in God's family, so here we are. Which is great, except think about how we feel when new people come in. It's always different, isn't it? And just as an aside, it's the most wonderful difference. It really is. So those who are visiting this morning, thank you so much for being here. Great scripture illustration you are. We do like it when new people come, but whenever someone new comes in, you know, imagine someone walks into your house and says, hi, I'm going to move in for a couple of weeks. By the way, let's move the furniture. (laughs) Yeah, you know how that feels, don't you? Like, I'm so glad you're here. Leave that alone. It's just because it's different. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just they want to do things a little differently. And that's going on in Matthew's church. And so a lot of the stories about Jesus that Matthew chooses to give us are ones to help bridge that. And frequently he will point out that, you know, somehow Jesus makes it possible for Jews and Gentiles to get along. For people who have been sitting in the very same pew for 87 years to get along with the people who just showed up this morning and who might have heaven forbid, sat in their pew. I'm glad you're laughing. I want to make sure you know I'm kidding. We don't own pews here. I've been to churches where people did have their pew. It's difficult. And so perhaps this story is for that kind of situation, and thus it applies to us as well. It's a story about how some people are there from the very beginning, from the crack of dawn, from the day the church was founded, or if they weren't their parents and their grandparents and their great-grandparents and so on, going back umpteen generations, have been there, have been a part of it. They belong. It's theirs. I served a church once where every fall they had a chicken pie supper, and there was one woman who could make the biscuits on all of the chicken pie. She ended up selling her house and moving into assisted living, but they went and they picked her up and they drove her over to the church. She even said to me one year, as I was the lucky one to drive her back, she said, I'm getting tired of this, I don't want to do it again. But next year, they went and they picked up Elizabeth and they brought her over to make all the biscuits. Elizabeth figured the only way out of it was to disappear, so she died. (laughs) At the age of 94... I wish I were kidding about this part, but I'm not. The church then had a meeting to decide whether they could have a chicken pie supper without her. Nobody else knew how to make biscuits? Come on. (coughs) We get set in our ways, and someone new comes in a little bit later, and this story's got that, right? We got new workers coming in at noon, and then some more coming in in the middle of the afternoon, and some coming in at the very last minute, and they come in, and they get just as much as everybody else. Like, shouldn't those of us who have been here longer get to go first at the lineup at the potluck dinner? And shouldn't we get, I don't know, the, the right to say how everything's going to go, and shouldn't we choose the hymns? And what about these new people coming in with newfangled ideas? <coughs> and against all of that, we have this story that challenges those ideas and points out to us how silly they are. Someone new and someone old and someone in between, there is somehow a way that we can work it out and work together in one church, in one setting. That's a powerful way to receive this parable. And sometimes we need to hear that message from it. Let me share another way. 
And several more recent scholars have suggested that perhaps we need to embrace this meaning more than we have before because of the way things are going in our world and because, as Amy Jill Levine put it in her wonderful book on the parables, she said, you know, you ought to go with the more uncomfortable reading because probably that's what Jesus meant. We often go for the, le the more comfortable one. Jesus probably meant the one that would make his listeners squirm. Maybe this is a story about economics. Maybe this is a parable about how we spend our money and how much we pay people and what people are worth and what they deserve. Now, it would have been a very believable parable for people in Jesus' time. This was a common practice. There were an awful lot of folks, often virtually everyone in town, who didn't have a job where, you know, you went to work each day and at the end of the week or the fortnight or whatever, you got a paycheck. Usually, most of the peasants worked by going to the town square at the crack of dawn and hoping someone who owned a piece of land, which was a very rare thing, would show up and say, yeah, I need a half dozen of you. Come with me and employ them for the day. And if you got hired first thing in the morning, you were pretty lucky, and that meant you would not only eat that day, but you could probably put a little money aside so you could pay your rent at the end of the month. If you didn't get hired first of the day, you'd wait there, though, in the hot sun, because hopefully they'd, someone else would show up later and say, yeah, I need some people for a few hours. Maybe in the afternoon they'd come. This is not an unbelievable story at all. Someone's gone out probably the night before and looked at his vineyard and thought, okay, yeah, those grapes are ready to pick. I need, let's say, a half dozen guys and grabs them first thing in the morning. And then at noon thinks, yeah, we got more grapes than I thought. I'll go get a couple more. Hires a couple more people who can at least work for the afternoon. Gets a few more people in the afternoon so they can get this job finished. And about an hour before quitting time realizes we are never going to get out of here by nightfall if I don't get a few more people. And goes and hires some last few and says, come on, give us a hand. We just want to get this job done and go home. So, so far, everyone listening to this parable when Jesus is telling is going, yeah, we believe this. This happens all the time. I don't know about here in Canada because I just haven't been back here that long, but I know in the U.S. it was very common. If you ever went to a place like Home Depot, early in the morning there would be a huge crowd of men there. They were almost always men. I don't think I ever saw a woman in the crowd. And they almost always were Hispanic. See, these were folks that in the U.S. didn't have working papers. If you don't have working papers, you can't get a job. You're not allowed to. It's illegal to pay you. So these guys would hang out at Home Depot and hope that when you showed up to pick up the lumber for your do-it-yourself project, you'd see them there and go, yeah, okay, I'll hire a couple of you. And all day long while they're working hard, they have no idea what they're going to get paid at the end of the day, and they're just hoping that maybe they might get enough that they can eat that night. If somebody paid them $10 for a full day's work, that's an appalling wage, but they can't complain to anyone because they're there illegally. That kind of situation is going on in Jesus' time. What makes this story completely weird, though, every parable, right, it's got some piece that suddenly comes choing in from left field. What makes this one strange is when they go to pay them, they take the guys who have only been working for one hour, and they pay them a full day's wage. And these guys who thought, hey, I'll be lucky to get a few bucks, but maybe we can scrape a little bit of food together for dinner tonight and not actually be starving when we go to bed, suddenly he's like, oh, my God. We can actually eat tonight, and, and, and maybe we can pay the rent this month and not get evicted. This is good. Meanwhile, the guys who got hired first in the morning are just like me, and perhaps you as well. Whenever I hear about money, I spend it, which is not a good idea. You should wait till you have the money. But not me. No, no, no. If someone says I'm going to get some money immediately in my mind. I've spent it 15 times over, over before I actually get the stuff, Right? That's what these guys who are hired first are doing. They're going, whoa, this is fantastic. They got a full day's wage. We're going to get like a week's pay for working one day. This is really good. So this will be like a big pizza tonight. We'll get a couple cases of beer. Can probably pay off the cell phone bill this week. And we'll have money for rent. This is really cool. And they go to get their wage and they get ex exactly the same amount as, as the jerks that got hired for only an hour. What? This is ridiculous. 
until the Luna, uh, sorry, not the Luna, that's a Hawaiian word, the supervisor <laughs> goes up to them and says, I, I paid you exactly what I, what I told you I would pay you, a full day's wage. And there's a wonderful line in here that's quite snarky. It often gets translated something like, you know, are you envious or is it a problem for you because I'm generous? But most um, scholars point out that it has a kind of snarky sarcasm to it. And it's more the sense of, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. Is it hurting you that I'm being nice? As if to make them feel just a little extra guilty. It's very uncomfortable to think that this might be about economics. That Jesus might be challenging us to think about day-to-day -day life. Surely Jesus will only challenge us to think about lofty things, right? Like eternal life and church and all that nonsense. Does Jesus really care about day-to-day -day living? Yeah. Yeah, he does. So would Jesus challenge us to think about how we live in our economy? Yeah, I think he would. See, our economy, the whole way our economic system works, it's pretty me-based. And we can all say this. It's pretty me-based, right? I deserve this because I have more education than you. I have a better last name than you. I live in a better neighborhood than you. I've lived here longer than you. I don't have an accent like you. I'm a nicer person than you. I go to a better church than you. We can find all sorts of reasons why we think we deserve more. I remember Bernie Sanders last year in the U.S. election campaign making a very important point. He said, it's, it's not the problem necessarily that some people have more money than others. It's just that for the people who have lots more, they don't pay anymore. If a loaf of bread cost more money for a millionaire, I'd be okay with that. But for them, it's a microscopic portion of their wealth, and for someone who's poor, it might be everything they have. We have incredible disparity in wealth, and it keeps getting worse, interestingly. While the majority of us in the middle are making more money than we were, the bulk of people beneath us are making far less, and the people above us are making far, far more. And there's probably something very wrong with that. We like bargains. We like to get the cheapest deal we can get, and then a story like this comes along and challenges us and suggests that maybe that's not always the best because that means someone is going with way less than they need. Because wouldn't it be wonderful if the economy were not about what we think we deserve, but it was, were about what we need? Now, I'm not an economist, and I'm not about to turn this into a lecture on economics. Phew, you're relieved there. I don't have solutions. But it still nags at the back of my mind that maybe this parable is Jesus saying to me, you know, I have to reconsider how I spend every penny. I have to think about the consequences of what I do. And when I'm thinking that, boy, I deserve more and more, Maybe I need to notice whether others deserve more as well. Now, nah, it would be much easier to think that this is just a story about how to, how to get along with newcomers in church. Because I know how to do that. I'm not so sure I know what to do with the other meaning. So I leave those two with you. I leave them with me. And we wonder. Let Jesus challenge us. Amen.